Engineers define unobtainium as a tangible but extremely rare, costly, or reasonably unobtainable material or mechanism. In this case, it refers to any of the parts of my first big restoration project, a Perpetuum Ebner Model 99D. First, a little background on Perpetuum Ebner, or PE as it was better known. The brand was one of the top end of turntables in Europe, and it was a very high top end brand here in North America. Founded in 1911 at St. Gergen, Bavaria, Germany, it originally made spring mechanisms for other manufacturers. Eventually, they became one of the first manufacturers of electric motors for turntables. After the Second World War, they branched out and started building full turntables, record players, motors, mechanisms, eventually dominating the German market by the early 1960s. As a matter of fact, my model, the 99V was the last in the Rex line, of which there were over 1 million produced and are still very common in Germany. The late 1950s and the early 1960s were the heyday of PE, with over 1,200 employees in a large new facility that opened in 1960. The brand was very popular among American servicemen and soon gained an international reputation for audio quality and craftsmanship. The second half of the 1960s was less kind to PE. Like all Western manufacturers of electronics, they faced steep competition from the Far East. Though they did try to convert to the transistor and circuit board revolution, the teenager being a prime example, a battery-operated turntable record player that offered a semi-karaoke effect with built-in microphone jack, was never very successful, even though it was a transistor-based and circuit board-based product. Few years of this, the company faced the inevitable layoffs, financial troubles, and then a merger, this time with another local audio company, Duel, in 1971. By the end of 1972, all manufacturing operations had stopped, and the brand lingered on with relabeled Duel products until its final demise in 1974. In 2015, the brand was brought back to life by Wolfgang Epting of WE Audio Systems and is once again making very high-end record players. As you can see, my Model 99 has not aged as gracefully as some of the others I have seen online. However, unlike many of the old gear one hears about on YouTube, I know this unit's complete history. Usually, if for something like this, you just hear little besides, I bought it at a flea market or a garage sale for next to nothing. Or, it was my dad's record player and I'd love to get it running again. My dad had picked this unit up in the early 1960s on one of his many trips overseas as a navigator in the RCAF. It was the fashion of the time to house your prized stereo in a large ornate cabinet. And my dad spent many a winter night in Winnipeg building such a cabinet from an old dresser. And there it stayed for most of my childhood and continuous loose until the early 1970s when my dad acquired a new amplifier and turntable and the PE with its old speakers were just put away someplace. A few years later, my dad retired from the, at that time, Canadian Armed Forces and the PE came with us to our present location here in Ottawa where the PE was rediscovered and my brother and myself found a place for it in our bedroom. It lasted there for a few months until my dad banished it to the basement rec room so he did not have to listen to our stupid music. Sometime in the late 1970s it had migrated to my little back up to my little brother's room where he reveled in playing his favorite disco records mostly I think just to annoy my eldest brother who's the hardcore rock and roll type. In what I guess was some sort of act of defiance my eldest brother cut out a resistor from the PE just before he left home at age 18 in 1977. As the PE no longer worked, it ended up in the attic, where it stayed slowly rotting away until 2020 pandemic boredom set in, and I decided I needed something to keep myself busy. After 40 plus years in the attic, the PE was a little worse for wear. The speakers were now nowhere to be found, and the last time I do remember seeing them was in my brother's workshop some 15 years ago. The unit was very dusty, and the turntable mat had decayed into some sort of hard plastic that I would think contained some very nasty 1950s and 60s chemicals. As well, rough handling up in the attic, the tone arm was damaged in a number of places, 
and the all-important spindle is nowhere to be found. This, of course, leads us to the unobtainium factor of the project. As the brand was never popular in North America, there is very little new old stock out there, and what there is is not what I need. I eventually did find a spindle, but it was for a different, though close, model, so I took a chance and ordered that. Next, I had to track down a schematic, which proved a little problematic, as I did find a number for the turntable mechanism, but none for the actual stereo system inside. Eventually, I did track one down and had to order it online. The tone arm, of course, was the showstopper. That is basically 100% unobtainium. I did find one online, and my first look, it was $125. The next time I looked a few days later, the price went up to $225. So, I think there's a little Google inflation going on. Anyway, I wasn't going to drop that much money for a tone arm, even one that was supposed to be new old stock. So, putting my old Airfix modeling skills to good use for once, I started to work on the tone arm as I figured I had nothing to lose in the end. I did manage to find most of the broken off bits in the attic and lying around in the cabinet but the all-important locking bar was long gone. Scratching about in the garage, I managed to find a steel rod that fit perfectly with the few bits of the locking bar I had left. Unfortunately, one side was completely missing, but I did have a few pieces of original plastic left over from some speaker jacks, and I might be able to fabricate a new piece from those. So I borrowed a technique that I had seen stonemason use trying to complete similar fixes. I took a piece of tape, applied the sticky side out, and then I used a little bit of Fuller's Earth, pulling it, pouring it over the exposed glue size. This gave me a template of the outline of the shape of the missing part. I then used that to transfer that template onto the old plastic jack, and then used the good old Dremel tool and nicely carve it down in an evening to fit the new piece in and stick it all together with clear epoxy, and the results were quite satisfactory. The other end of the tone arm was a little more problematic. I did have most of the smash bits, but the epoxy alone was not strong enough to hold it together, and when I tried to test it, it snapped along the same fracture lines. Balking at dropping that $150 to $200 for a new tone arm, I borrowed another technique. This time, it's the way they used to fix broken china in the old days with a staple. So using that last bit of steel rod, I fashioned two staples, and with my new Dremel drill press, I made some very nice little holes, and then stuck in the two steel staples, and then covered them with a great deal of clear epoxy. And the fix was good. It seemed to work perfectly. And the good thing was that the housing for the control hides the repair. With the tone arm all nicely restored, I took the opportunity, while waiting for most of my unobtainium parts to come in to clean up the mechanism. And I simply just went through it, removed all the old compacted grease and carefully cleaned and then re-greased the whole system. I then decided to tackle the various rubber parts that were found on the turntable. Of course the platter mat was in terrible shape. The mounting grommets had decayed to some very hard form of rubber. Timing belts were completely shot, but fortunately the drive wheel was in good shape. We are quite lucky these days that there are quite a number of online retailers that do sell the rubber parts for turntables like this. And I ordered from one a new mat, as well as what I would hope would be the right size grommets and the right size belts. While waiting for those to come in, I tackled the green mess that was found on the top of the turntable platter. And eventually I got it out using the combination of just chipping away at it slightly and a little bit of isopropyl alcohol to clean up the leftover goop. Also, while waiting for the other parts to come in, my schematic came in, and I took the opportunity to figure out just what resistor my older brother had cut out, and it turned out to be a 700 ohm 5 watt resistor, and I just happened to have two handy in my very limited box, part boxes, so I did the first fix of the electronics of the system. It came in were not really the right type. The drive belts were a little too small and the mounting grommets were all completely wrong. However, with a little bit of shoe glue and a lot of imagination, I eventually did get a fairly good fit. With all the rubber parts installed and the new 5 watt resistor, I did a gradual power up utilizing my Variac. Well, I didn't get any magic smoke, 
but I did find the new belts were much too tight and the drive did not run very well. I guess there's just too much friction. But it did work, and I was quite happy about that after, what, 40 years? With most of the mechanical problems worked out in the drive, except for that spindle, which I was still waiting to get, I decided to move on to the electronic parts of the project. But that is another story.